thank you for inviting me to this title, Conflicting Narratives and Values, Perspectives for a Common Vision and a Culture of Peace. I would have liked to be with you uh, in London, but for personal reasons, I couldn't leave uh, my, my country. But uh, with the miracles of the technologies of communication, it is as if I were physically uh, with you there uh, in the, that conference room. So it's uh, <clears throat> with pleasure, really, that uh, I will contribute to the debate on this uh, issue uh, with some reflections about uh, um, the links uh, between, on the one side, uh, conflicting values and conflicting narratives, and on the other side, the outbreak of uh, certain wars. In internal conflicts uh, and wars between neighboring countries do not suddenly break out from a vacuum, as it can be seen in Ethiopia or in Ukraine, for example. They are often the results of ongoing tensions uh, deeply rooted in history or in conflicting and even aggressive narratives. The wars in the Balkans after the collapse of the Yugoslav Federation in the 1990s, for example, were the last example of it in the 20th century. National, uh, ethnic, linguistic, and religious identities exacerbated by biased and inflammatory narratives in the political discourse, in the media, and in school education, as well as territorial claims were at the heart of massacres perpetrated for several years in former Yugoslavia. The war about uh, the war between Azerbaijan and Armenia that flared up again uh, in 2020 is another example of the dramatic consequences of long-standing violent rhetoric grounded in irredentist nationalism. On the 24th of February, historical date now, unfortunate historical date, to everyone's surprise, the Russian army invaded Ukraine from the north, the south, and the east. But that this should not have been a surprise. Since the duo Dmitry Medvedev and Vladimir Putin came to power in Moscow, Russia has been waging war ever. In the years 1999-2000, Vladimir Putin led the Second Chechen War as prime minister. His public, publicly stated goal was the eradication of the Chechen nation. According to Putin's narrative, it was not a war, but a special anti-terrorist operation against separatists to preserve the territorial integrity of the Russian Federation. During this operation, the capital Grozny was completely razed to the ground by Russian bombing, to the extent that in 2003, the United Nations called Grozny the most destroyed city on earth. Since then, unfortunately, the Ukrainian city of Mariupol has probably overtaken it. In 2008, Russia fomented the separatist war in South Ossetia and in Abkhazia in Georgia, recognized their independence and has since provided them with the so-called protection of his military. Putin's narrative to justify his aggression was then to save the Russian speakers of Georgia. Since 2014, the Ukrainian territories of the Donbass and Crimea have been wrested from Ukraine. About the annexation of Crimea, Putin's narrative was that Stalin had attached Crimea to the Soviet Socialist Republic of Ukraine by mistake, and the inhabitants of the peninsula were historically Russian. As to the conflict in Donbass, Putin's rhetoric was it was an internal conflict between persecuted and discriminated Russian speaking Ukrainians and their national, nationalist government in Kiev. But he claimed that he was not involved. However, everybody knows that he was using the separatists as proxies to destabilize Ukraine. In Syria, another war in the years 2015 2018, Putin's war led to massive destruction. 
Officially, it was to help dictator Bashar al-Assad defeat ISIS and other Islamist terrorist groups. It was also, he said, to protect Christians and their churches from these groups, and, he does, and thus to appear as the great and only defender of Christianity in the Middle East, especially orthodoxy, a path that European governments were reluctant to take for various reasons that I will not analyze here. Vladimir Putin was very publicly thanked by Eastern Orthodox Church dignitaries for his military involvement in Syria. However, behind this official narrative, there was also the plan to rid Bashar al-Assad of his various political opponents at the cost of massacring civilians, destroying homes, hospitals, schools, infrastructure, providing water, electricity to the population. Aleppo became a martyred city and Russia lost, lost its seat on the UN Human Rights Council as a result. Putin's narrative is well known and well oiled. He is now applying it in the rest of Ukraine as he has done in all his other previous wars. In Putin's narrative, Ukraine as a sovereign state never existed in the past and was just called Little Russia. The current United, uh, Ukrainian state is an artificial state run by Nazis. Ukrainian identity does not exist and the Ukrainian language is just an offshoot of the noble and rich Russian language, according to Putin. The country must be allegedly denazified and disarmed. Ukraine is part of the Slavic world and therefore part of Russia, just like Belarus, he says. The current Ukrainian state, its language and culture must be destroyed. Its territory must be invaded by war, whatever the cost, it must be occupied and russified again. Its remaining inhabitants and their future generations must be colonized. This is the narrative that Putin is serving up to the entire Russian population and the international community. The Ukrainian counter narrative, or one of those counter narratives, is that Kyiv existed long before Moscow and was the cradle orthodoxy, first with the conversion of Prince Vladimir in Kherson by a bishop of the Patriarchate of Constantinople, and then with the baptism of his people in Kyiv, Rus, in the Rus of Kyiv in 989, why the first records of Moscow's existence date back only uh, <clears throat> to 1147, which means 160 years later. Conflict of narratives, as you can see. The war with its cynical procession of terror, war crimes, crimes against humanity, enables Putin to depopulate the country through mass migrations to the West, and mass deportation of Ukrainians to the east, to Russia. The territories, <clears throat> the territories occupied since 2014 have been colonized and russified. All Orthodox churches that were not under the jurisdiction of the Moscow Patriarchate have been eradicated, as have been other religions which did not recognize the annexation of Crimea and Putin's rule. But let's go back to the title of this session, which contains two keywords, conflicting narratives. In totalitarian or dictatorial societies, there can be no confrontation of ideas. In the case of Putin's Russia, there is only one truth, the one of the leader. Putin has been preparing his war against Ukraine for a very long time. For two decades, he has built up a colossal armament, including nuclear weapons. With the blessing of Patriarch Kirill, the blessing of Patriarch Kirill, he has progressively eliminated religious diversity, for example, by criminalizing the activities of Jehovah's Witnesses as extremists. And about a hundred of them are in prison for many years and many more are on the same path. Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, have been expelled from Russia. 
all Russian NGOs receiving money from the West, including from the European Union, have been accused of being foreign agents and banned. The editor of Novaya Gazeta, who was awarded the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize in December of last year, had to close his newspaper to avoid going to prison. All independent media have been closed, fined heavily or have survived only abroad. More than 3,000 websites have been closed. A law has criminalized the, the use of the word war in public or private spaces. Of course, it's not a war in Ukraine. As we know, it's just a special military operation. And according to that law, there are sentences of up to 15 years in prison if you use the word war in public. Public anti-war demonstrations have been prohibited. And even individual silent picketing is also forbidden. In Putin's narrative, the claim Slavic Orthodox identity of Russia is strongly intertwined. This identity is supposed to be threatened by a decadent West that advertises homosexuality, same-sex marriages, gender, cul gender culture, woke culture, and other so-called decadent values in opposition to the traditional values of the Orthodox Church. A Western world that believes itself to be invested with a civilizational and civilizing mission and that it wants to impose on the rest of the world, including Russia and other Slavic lands by, for example, financing NGOs, human rights organizations and media and <clears throat> importing uh, its pseudo values into Russia. A messianism that has produced genocidal colonialism and supremacist imperialism for centuries, according to Putin. Hence the need to protect, vaccinate and purify Russian society against this Western plague. Patriarch Kirill and the president have long been staunch allies in this fight against the West. And the head of the Russian Orthodox Church has blessed the war on Ukraine as a metaphysical war against evil forces. The growing desire of Ukraine to divorce itself from the Russian world and to make a new life for itself with another partner, the European Union, based on democratic values, had become an existential threat to Russia. This so-called infidelity in a forced marriage had, be, had to be brought to an end. Hence, the appalling war that we are now witnessing. Let's return to the question in the title, and then I will finish my presentation. In the title, there was also the question, what are the prospects for a common vision of a culture and peace? My question is, what are the prospects in the case of Russia and Ukraine? This question, I think, is coming too late because the war is too far advanced and perhaps we should have better worked on this issue in the West and in Ukraine in due time. And there were such opportunities. Maybe, maybe the outcome would have been different, but maybe not. So the answer is now very simple and very short. These prospects are nil because the values of Russia and the values of Ukraine have become irreconcilable. At most, they could coexist in their respective territories after the war behind the cultural iron curtain, maybe or maybe not, we will see. Without wishing to play the Cassandra, however, I would dare say that there is something more serious ahead. Putin's war in Europe against democratic values is only the first wide scale assault on the West. The great dictatorial and conquering empires of the past are waking up in Moscow, in Istanbul, in Beijing. China with its dictatorial regime is on the same path as Putin's Russia against the expansion of Western values at home and in the world. And it may now be time to think about avoiding 
a new hybrid global war. Thank you for your attention.